Let's begin. Um, Trina Robbins, in her history book, Pretty in Ink, notes that the late 70s saw a boom in self-published and small press black and white comics because people like Gary Arlington had begun to open specialty comic book stores. Although she does not state it explicitly, she implies that this was the reason behind restarting women's comics. In other words, she saw the market reopen. But in your interview with the Lambic Comic Cyclopedia, you note that you felt that there was a feeling of fresh blood in the form of Catherine Lemieux, Phoebe Glockner, and Dory that really restarted women's. When you edited that first issue, did you feel or were you aware of that market shift as a comic artist yourself, or did that redevelopment of women's really feel as if it were a response to purely new talent? I think it was, uh, I felt it was a response to new talent. There was Karen, there was me, there was um, others that I can't remember right now, but yeah, but definitely that. Gotcha. Okay. So it felt more individualistic. Okay. Yeah. Um, during our last conversation, you mentioned that you felt that working on that first issue was really difficult. In what ways was editing difficult for you on that first issue? Well, I had never done it before, mm -hmm. and I was finding my way with um, some help, but um, mostly I had to do it by me. I had to figure it out on my own. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, did much of that difficulty come from working with artists outside of where you lived? I don't remember that being hard at all. No, really? it's just the, um, the the putting together of the actual pages and figuring out the order and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was just all new to me. Gotcha. Um, how did you communicate with those artists? Did you just, who were like not living there, did you just get like people who had sent in submissions? How did you receive contacts? I'm, I probably called them. Mm -hmm. I'm because we didn't have email back then. Yeah. And, um, they couldn't come to the meetings, which were, um, regular as needed. Mm -hmm. Um, so it must have been that. Gotcha. Did you feel... I don't think I relied on regular mail. Okay. It's too slow. Um, did you feel stressed in rejecting people's work? I don't think I did reject anybody. That's the thing. You, you, it was frowned upon. Okay. You accepted everybody. Uh, really? Okay. Did you feel that your work on that first post-hiatus issue was a response to, the, to issue seven or the outlaws issue? Oh, neither one. It, it was, uh, I just tried to find things that were funny in my mind and go from there. How Being did the... funny was the main goal. Oh, okay. Me. Gotcha. That's kind of interesting because I think that you include uh, Phoebe Glockner's um, extremely harrowing story, Private Display, in that issue. And I was wondering, it has, it's, it's got a much more serious tone than most of the other stories in that issue. Um, and oh. was that intensity deliberate on your part when you chose to include that? Oh, no. Phoebe's work is so wonderful. I think any smart editor would want that in the, in the, in the comic. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have uh, ever said no to that. I mean, she doesn't try to be funny. I'm the one that's trying to be funny. Gotcha. And a few <laughs> others. How did the pre-hiatus issues, general layouts, or artwork develop that post-hiatus issue, that first post-hiatus issue? I felt pretty. I didn't. I didn't pay any attention to what had gone before, except it was, you know, it was a comic. Gotcha. And I, was, so I'm, I love graphic art, and that was more in my mind. Mm. Uh, how to look good, um, in a black and white way. Okay. You mentioned M. K. Brown as a big inspiration for your work in our last conversation but she did not publish her work in the pre-hiatus issue of Women's. Linda Berry, according to, her according to her book, Blabber, 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 was also inspired by M.K. Brown, whom Berry mentions along with Gahan Wilson and Ed Zubitsky. Apparently, Berry found their work in the National Lampoon. How did you yourself find Brown's work? National Lampoon. Gotcha. Were other artists with whom you worked inspired by her work too, beyond Linda? I don't remember talking about that. Okay. Um, since she wasn't at meetings, mm -hmm. well, you know, it, it may have come up in conversation because, in general, her stuff is loved. 
but I can't remember back that far. Okay. Um, but everyone I know who loves her really loves her. Gotcha. So they're just perfection. Mm. Did you, like Barry, did you find Crumb at a too young age? Um, not young. I was in my 20s. Okay. Well, that's sort of young. Gotcha. How did you find Underground Comics? Um, I was dating someone in Baltimore who uh, took me to a motorcycle repair shop because he had a bike. And they, they, were, they were very smart there, and they had a rack of comics that included women's comics. First, first issue. So I bought my first issue there. And from then on, I, I must have thought it out. Um, because I ended up getting all the, you know, all the old ones for the next few years. Okay. And I had them when I came to California to live. And I came to California to be part of the underground comic movement. Okay. In part. How do you think... Um... Robin's generation and the pre-hiatus artists differed in terms of how they found underground comics in comparison to you. Well, my guess is Trina, because she's she knows everybody and and talks about things, and, and I, um, you know, I don't know if Comic Con was going on back then, but mm -hmm. she makes things known, and I'm sure she had a big part in. Getting, people, getting the message out. Plus, being in San Francisco, um, a lot of artists lived here. Mm -hmm. and it was kind of a natural development. But this is just guesswork. Okay. What was Pretty the, good guess, though. What was the 21st century woman to women comic artists in the 80s? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, the first issue that you edited um, is called The 21st Century Woman, and on it you have a cyborg woman with a June Cleaver Memorial biorhythmic necklace and a built-in calculator belt for budgeting household expenses. It establishes that the comic is, like, for the, both the new and old. Um, although the woman is a cyborg, she's still a signifier of the patriarchy. She has a mammary lactation device. Um, and one of your comics for the issue is Sliding, in which one woman, who looks like a later character in Alice's vanishing act, speaks with a different woman. This woman has the hairdo and dress of a professional woman. Yuppies are a common subject of the post-hiatus issues. But her dialogue shows that that professionalism may be a guise. She mentions, she mentions that if a man notices me, I feel like melting, while your Alice look-alike stares at her without looking at the reader, implying judgment or sadness. I also appreciate that that woman, that that, prefer, that professional woman's nice reaction to the waiter's accidental water spill. Um, in your conversations with like ambitious, ambitious fellow artists, did you feel that simultaneous sense of relationship obsession that the professional woman has in that comic? Yeah, I think she was a, she was a, not exactly forward thinking. <laughs> I certainly meant her that way. Okay. You know, depended on men for happiness. I see. And did you feel like that was a reflection of the people with whom you worked? Oh, no. Okay. It, just gener in general. Okay. I think there's plenty of women out there like that. Gotcha. Y even today. What made you come back to the editing position in the occult issue? And what about the topic caught your eye? It was probably because nobody else would. Okay. I don't remember exactly... I, I don't particularly like a cult, to tell you the truth. Oh, really? Okay. No. How did, um, how did, there's a really interesting story from an Italian artist called Cecilia Capuana's, um, uh, called The Night. Um, it's kind of abstract. It doesn't really have a traditional narrative. Um, and I was wondering, what about that specific comic caught your eye? Oh, it, it actually didn't really catch my eye. It was well done, and she sent it in, and so we put it in the comic. Okay. Gotcha. You have to understand that I didn't have much power to say no. Mm. Um, and we also didn't have a whole lot of, um, we didn't have a surplus of entries. Okay. I hope I'm remembering this right about, you know, I, 
I think as a group, we may have said no to people. Okay. But I could not tell you what, who they were. But we would, we would go through entries in these big meetings. These meetings were at least 10 people. Okay. And uh, it's, it's possible that we put the kibosh on some or many. Okay. But they would have ne- never been heard of, heard from again. Okay. Most likely. Okay. Last time we spoke, I mentioned how I felt your comics had influence on your more abstract works, especially the ones involving teacups. Um, I said that because your comics often have a lot of white space, little dialogue, and often include many, and I do mean many, like in a meal's cafe, for example, a non-human entities who speak or have voice thoughts with what little dialogue you use. In fact, your comics, beginning with the story of Menage a Trois, begin to have a more um, begin to have more non-human entities given either voice thoughts or speech. But I have looked through your non-watercolors and have found more human figures, one interestingly in a cup of tea. How did your work with comics <laughs> inspire your work now? And do you feel as if there is mo- less or more influence that your comics have on either your watercolors or drawings? Oh. <sighs> everything is... Everything influences... The, everything else. Okay. I'm, I'm, um, when I sit down to paint, it's, or draw, it's a hodgepodge of ideas, comic ideas, floating things. I'm drawing teacups all the time and girls' faces. It's just a huge mashup. Okay. And it, blending into each other. It, to this day. Gotcha. There's there's a few there are two like um, drawings that you have that I saw in your collection called Hello. Or excuse me, not called that, but they have. Um, there's one specific painting in which you have one character say Hello, and then another say Ah Dad, and then you have another painting in which a woman goes R. And what's interesting is that those 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 paintings look really comicky. In fact, they look more comicky than many of your comics. And I was kind of wondering was that did you kind of feel or notice that those things to you felt more comic-y than many of your other work oh sure they, these are the things oh arg right that arg is my facebook uh, pro- profile picture now it's my <laughs> favorite one of all time gotcha um but the uh i'm i'm mainly a cartoonist and uh I doodle a lot. Okay. And the hello and all dad because he's being embarrassed by his father. Yeah. Or um, one, of my, one of my favorite doodles. An org with a doodle. And uh, <laughs> there's something next to it with a, a girl holding a birthday cake. Yeah. Slice flying through the air. Yeah. That's just a, a happy little doodle. Gotcha. I, I've decided that's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> and the others, there's a lot here who that are much more... Um, planned and carefully executed. Okay. What would those be? Oh, there's a there's a picture. I was trying to be an illustrator at some point before I realized I didn't really want to be an illustrator. And there's a it's a picture of uh, two guys and a girl, and it was um, it's supposed to be. I can't get at it now. Uh, Oh, it was just that was that's one of them. It's was carefully drawn and painted and it's bigger than the rest. And then there's a couple couple here that are um done on a computer. Mm-hmm. And that took a lot of work. Gotcha. The first drawing on your on your um on your photo gallery website is a very is a very detailed drawing in comparison to the stuff you do in your comics. Um, and it's it's a woman going through plants with her son. Was that one of the comics that, or excuse me, one of the the paintings that took a lot of uh, labor and planning on your end? I'll say, and I, and that's unlike everyone else. This was a, an attempt to be on the cover of the New Yorker. Okay. Because even though I knew they would turn me down, I thought, why not send them something spectacular? And I'm okay. really proud of that one. Yeah, it's it's very, it's extremely intricate. And yeah. yeah. And what about 
And but there's there's another one here that looks a lot more like the work you're doing in your comics, um, and it's two people kind of staring at the quote unquote camera, uh, with a cat facing away <laughs> from the audience. Yeah, that was a Christmas card. Oh, okay. And it said, "May the joy and happiness of this season warm your days," or something like that. Oh, okay. It was a sarcastic card, which pissed off some people, baffled others, and. Enjoyed um, tickled other people. Yeah, what's interesting is that in that specific photograph, or excuse me, not photograph, but in that in that painting, um, you have the cat staring away, and it doesn't have as much kind of um, agency as you would give a lot of your like dogs in your comics, as well as um, non <laughs> non human entities. <laughs> oh, true. It's because cats are very hard to draw. I find. Okay. And gotcha. it works here. People, everyone, everyone knows it's a cat. Gotcha. In what way is making a narrative comic like making narrative non-narrative art? Oh, it's many times as hard. I told, uh, well, I do have a lot of trouble coming up with stories. I don't think I apply myself enough, mm -hmm. but they're not just, they're not popping out of me the way other people's are. Some people just sit down and they they have a story. They just know what to do with a beginning, middle, and an end. Okay. Um, that's why so many of my things in women's are one pagers. Okay. Because I do one pagers pretty well. I wish I could always just do one pagers. Gotcha. Um, what do you find more rewarding for you, making non-narrative art or making narrative art? I guess non-narrative. Okay. Yeah, so it's easier. Okay. And I can do exactly what I want. All right. Well, Lee, I think that's enough questions for today. <laughs>